Amen. I think we did sing all four verses, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> when I was up there, I wasn't quite sure how many we had gotten through. All right, let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Acts, a wonderful passage of Scripture before us tonight. Not because somebody gets killed in it, but because it teaches us some very important principles of prayer. We're in Acts chapter 12 tonight. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 5, the Lord willing. It's very interesting how this is set up for us in the closing verses of chapter 11. Now last week, of course, we had our fifth Sunday special. We had the very, very edifying video entitled, The Book of Mormon versus the Bible, in which very clearly laid out for us by these former Mormons who are trying to reach their own relatives for Christ, how they discovered, after doing some study, and some of them even having degrees in archaeology from Mormon universities, they discovered that it was all phony, that there was nothing that uh, could be pointed to that said, see, here is where this particular group of people live that's mentioned in the Book of Mormon, or see, here is a uh, an archaeological site where we can dig up the the weapons of this great battle where millions of people were slaughtered. It was all make-believe. And so I hope, I hope that it gave you some encouragement and some ammunition for when you are witnessing to Mormons who may perhaps knock on your door at some time. Don't let them into your house, of course, because the Bible tells you not to do that. Second John verses 7 through 11. Uh, but certainly go out on the front porch and tell them, are you aware of the fact that share with them some of the things that you learned last week. But the week before that, we were looking at verses 27 through 30 in Acts chapter 11. And I'm going to start there because we've had an interruption in between. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. And there stood up one of them named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be a great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. A good number of years have gone by since Acts chapter 2, when we get to this point. And we see that it is moving into a period of time where although there is trouble in Jerusalem from a famine that's going to come up, the persecution has pretty much settled down. And we're told that earlier in the book of Acts, as soon as Saul is no longer on the scene causing trouble, uh, the Jewish religious leaders basically have given up on the persecution. But Satan has not. And that's what we're going to see happening in Acts chapter 12 as we move into the first five verses of that chapter. Satan will not leave us alone even when people get tired of harassing us. Satan will always raise up someone else who will cause grief for the church. Sometimes it's internal problems. Sometimes it's external problems. We always have to fight with our old sin nature, and each one of us causes problems for ourselves and for others. But when a particular persecutor stops persecuting, Satan is always busy trying to find someone else who will do the job to try to crush the church. So now we see the church is about to face a very difficult time in Jerusalem with famine. And so Satan is going to bring a double whammy into their lives. Satan's going to bring some trouble that they were not expecting. We'll see just how bad that is in just a moment and how bad the man is that is going to bring that trouble on the church. But we find that as we look here in this text from the last time we were together, that we find three major role reversals in this passage. Saul, the chief persecutor, becomes the chief teacher of practical Christianity. We noted last week that whereas we think of Paul as the one who wrote the great doctrinal epistles, the way in which Paul preached, as we go through the book of Acts, was practical Christianity. What we've been studying Sunday mornings, what you believe will affect 
the way that you live. When we look at the other portions of the epistles, we discover that really the point of those epistles is that your doctrine is designed to radically alter your life by the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul spends a great deal of time on that, and we looked at many different examples last week, talking about the doctrine of the sovereignty of God, talking about the doctrine of election, and so on. Not designed to let us rest on our laurels, but rather designed to give us encouragement that because God is sovereign and God's word is supernatural, that we can carry it forth and know that there will be results. The second major role reversal that we noticed was down here in verse 29. The disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. They're sending back to the mother church. The mother church was the one who had given to them in the first place. The mother church was the one that had encouraged them. The mother church was the one that had sent out missionaries, if you will, to get these smaller daughter churches started. And now we find that the mother church is the one who is in need. But you know, I couldn't help but thinking, as I was preparing the message two weeks ago, and then preparing again tonight, that it seems very, very much like the Bible Presbyterian Church. This is the mother church of the entire denomination. Jerusalem was the mother church. Jerusalem was in trouble. Jerusalem had provided for all those daughter churches, and I've heard the great stories of Dr. McIntyre raising funds for other young men who were struggling in ministry and trying to build Bible Presbyterian churches. And someone told me at one point that he had actually built 40 other churches before he built this building here for other young men who were planting Bible Presbyterian churches in different parts of the United States and in other parts of the world. And he raised funds for those. This church was strong then. This church had a good income then. This church had resources then. But now it's like we've come to a famine. There are other Bible Presbyterian churches out there not merely in this country, but around the world. This past week, I, I received a, a beautiful hardback book, maybe 150, 200 pages long, a large book about this size. Glossy paper, you know, the clay-based paper, full-color photographs all the way through from a church in Singapore celebrating their Silver Jubilee. A church that had grown from a handful of people to a very, very large multi-staff church with 10 or 11 ministers on the staff. And indeed, we rejoice with them. In fact, along with that, they sent one of their little quarterly magazines. In fact, they sent five copies of it. The elders will be getting some of those in our elders meeting this, this uh, month. Did you know it's so interesting? You know what the front cover of that magazine was? was a picture of Bible Presbyterian Church of Collingswood. That church is really ultimately a daughter or granddaughter church of this church. And God has blessed that church. And they're actually using, in fact, twice in that magazine, pictures of this church, once in the cover and once on one of the articles inside where it is blended underneath the text of the article, pictures of Bible Presbyterian Church of Collingswood. And you know, we rejoice with them in that. But I couldn't help wondering whether God might move some of the folks that have benefited so much from the ministry here to once again provide relief for this ministry as well. Don't know if he will do that. It's within his sovereign power, of course, to do it. It's within his sovereign power to withhold it. But it is certainly something that we could pray for. You see, there was a, a bond of love here in the early church where those believers recognized what Paul calls a duty to send relief back to Jerusalem because the famine was going to hit Jerusalem in a most devastating way. Jerusalem no longer had the resources. These folks at Antioch did have resources. Interesting role reversal number two that we see there. And certainly you can pray that God will move 
some of those who have benefited from this ministry and pray for that especially as we approach the 75th anniversary and we saw that Paul explained that exact principle in the doctrinal epistles Romans 15 27 it has pleased them verily and their debtors they are for if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things and we looked at that context of that which was the churches of Macedonia and Achaia making a contribution for the poor saints which were at Jerusalem back in verse 26. Paul called them debtors and he called them those who had a duty, not an option, but a duty and a debt. We talked about financial giving, we talked about stewardship, we talked about sacrificial giving. We asked ourselves the question, have we truly given in sacrificial methods and sacrificial means? And we saw that Paul was talking from experience. He was not talking from theory. Very important for him to be able to preach that with an articulate power. That this was not a theory that he was placing on others. He was not being as the Jewish leaders and as Jesus condemned them for. Saying to them that do what they tell you to do but don't do what they do. Because they don't lift a finger bear the burdens that they're talking about. And so we saw that the Apostle Paul had already practiced what he was preaching. The third major role reversal that we saw in those passages was down in verse 30, starting back in 29. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did, and set it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Here's the role reversal where Saul, who used to confiscate the goods and the property of the church, is now entrusted with a huge sum of money, enough to meet all the needs of the believers in the church in Jerusalem. We saw how those churches of Macedonia gave. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 said that they gave in the great trial of affliction from uh, their deep poverty. It abounded unto the riches of their liberality. That was generous giving. It was sacrificial giving. And Paul then entreats others to do the same thing. So many of the New Testament epistles speak of that principle. There's a genuine need. There was going to be a famine. God's people had advance warning. We also have advance warning of what's coming, both here in the United States and around the world. And as you know, we are having an Islamization of the United States at this point. Our president is pushing for that. He's giving special time to Islam. He is promoting it in many different ways. We'll not go into that. But people, the time is coming when there is going to be a famine, not so much for bread, though there that might be that as well, but for a hearing of the word of God. The Old Testament speaks of that. A time where churches like this will be shut down. A time where churches who preach the truth and who insist that the Bible is the final authority will be closed. There will be a famine for the hearing of the word of God. People will not come to those churches. You can look around and see that they are staying away in droves. They do not want to hear the word of God. And there will come if there is not seed that is sown in hearts that bears fruit. There will soon be a famine for there will be no harvest. It's coming, folks. I think it may already be upon us. And then we talked about the prophet Agabus here. We saw how God promises to supply our needs. He supplies our needs through other believers in most situations. And those prophecies of scripture always come true. They always happen. That's the test of a true prophet. And we talked about the true prophets and those tests in Deuteronomy chapter 18 two times ago. We saw that Agabus was not the only prophet. It says there were prophets that came Unto, uh, to Jerus from Jerusalem unto Antioch, down in verse 27. But the one that is mentioned by name and the one whose prophecy is recorded for us is the one who prophesied concerning a genuine need that was about to happen in Jerusalem. We talked about it's not how much you give, but it's how much you retain for yourself. That's really the test that God puts to it, and Jesus said so in that parable of the poor widow. 
We saw that the one who loves much gives much, the one who loves little gives little. And Jesus made that very clear when he went to eat with one of the Pharisees who did not even wash his feet when he came into the house and the, quote, sinful woman brought a box of alabaster ointment and poured on him and wept on his feet and wiped his feet with the hairs of her head. And Jesus closed that passage in Luke chapter 7, verse 47, Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And we close with noting that that is the kind of love that we are to have one for another. Jesus said so just before he went to the cross in John 13. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. That's sacrificial giving. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you have love one to another. So that brings us to chapter 12, and we look now at the first five verses. Now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison. Oh, how we are glad that the last half of that verse is here. But prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. There's so much contained in that one little phrase, as we'll see. Now, we mentioned a few minutes ago that the Jewish religious leaders have apparently, by this point, slowed down their persecution. And so Satan raises up someone in secular government. Religion quits persecuting, and so secular government starts to persecute. You know, it's interesting, as you look at the history of the church around the world, many times you find that it is religious leaders who first start persecution, and then you find that there is secular government that continues the persecution. You think about Roman Catholicism and the persecution that it has raised against Bible-believing Christians in many different countries around the world, and when that has sort of faded out and when the Inquisition seems to at least have partially faded back into history and it's not as, as vocal and not as open as it used to be, that now there are secular governments, in some cases communist governments, that have replaced those who are in the Dominicans and the Jesuit orders that were busy persecuting Christians, and now these secular governments have risen up to persecute. We find that there had been persecution of believers in England and Holland and other places, and they fled to this country so that they might have religious freedom. And now we find secular government is rising up and persecuting the church and saying that we cannot have a voice in the public square. Rather interesting as you look at history because we see the first inklings of that as we look here at Acts chapter 12. Rather interesting who was raised up in this secular government to do it for those Jews who perhaps had gotten weary of it and were busy making money or whatever else they were into. Satan raised up Herod, a truly decadent and truly evil leader, as we'll see in a moment. This particular Herod, there were lots of Herods, this particular Herod enjoyed killing people for fun and for political gain. Now in this case, here in Acts chapter 12, he sees an opportunity to keep the troublesome Jews under his rule happy by killing Christians, and so he does it. Let's talk about those Herods for just a second so you can see which one this is and just how truly evil this family was. And Herod is a family name, like Spencer or McCoy or Whitbeck. That's a family name. The question is, which Herod is the one that's mentioned here? This particular Herod is Herod Agrippa I. He is the grandson of Herod the Great, who is the guy who killed the babies in Bethlehem. So you've got Herod the Great. He's got four wives, plus multiple concubines. By those four wives, he has a whole slew of different children. 
Some of those wives he killed, some of those children he killed. There was a, an old saying that it was uh, better to be one of Herod's pigs than it was to be one of his wives, because Herod would kill his wives, but he would never eat pork, so he didn't kill the pigs. So the one we're talking about here in Acts chapter 12 is the grandson of Herod the Great who killed the babies in Bethlehem. Herod the Great is the founder of that very rotten clan with the four wives and the many, many concubines. And the children of his wives had all kinds of immoral and incestuous marriages. So now here we are, Herod Agrippa I in Acts 12. The uncle of Herod Agrippa I was Herod Philip the first. Now you've heard of him. You've heard of him back in the Gospels. He was the first husband of Herodias, who was then taken by Herod Antipas, a half-brother of Herod Philip. They had the same father. They had different mothers. In a double incestuous marriage, because she was his blood half-brother's wife, and she was his blood niece. Herod Antipas was the one who killed John the Baptist. So we've got a pretty nasty family tree here so far. So now, Herod Agrippa I, he's the one here in Acts 12. He's also, get this, the full brother of Herodias. This is the guy who's killing James. His full sister was Herodias one who did not like the fact that John the Baptist had said it is unlawful for thee to have thy brother's wife and Herodias was bent out of shape over that and so she plotted until finally she got John the Baptist killed. Herodias had a daughter. The daughter of Herodias as you know was named Salome. Salome is the girl who danced before Herod Antipas and got John the Baptist killed. Now the plot thickens even worse. Salome married Herod Philip II. Herod Philip II was her great uncle and the uncle of her mother Herodias. Folks, these were not nice people. They enjoyed debauched, decadent immorality, and they had fun killing people. That's the family line that we're talking about here. Most of the people who think of Herod think about Herod the Great killing the babies in Bethlehem. Listen, this was family practice. This was the kind of thing that, with horrendous immorality running through every generation, murdered people and committed all kinds of horrible adultery and incest and fornication and rape and all kinds of horrible, horrible, horrible things. So, what happened that this guy, Herod Antipas I, what happened that he was able to catch James, the brother of John? You remember as you look back in the preceding chapters here in the book of Acts, that all of the apostles had stayed at Jerusalem when the church was scattered under the persecution that was raised by Saul. And as we go through those opening chapters, they seem to be living charmed lives. They're coming in and out of Jerusalem, they're going to different places and coming back to Jerusalem, and nobody ever seems to be able to catch them. Nobody ever seemed to be able to find them, even though Saul had been very, very thorough in his hunt. Perhaps the church had gotten complacent. Perhaps they thought that their spy network, an insider spy network, we've talked about that in detail in the past, perhaps they thought that that was working so well that they would always get a tip off when the authorities were coming. It had worked for years up to that point. Perhaps, because that seems to be the key to this passage, perhaps it was because the church had gotten slothful prayer. Well, that's a warning, folks. Perhaps it was because the church had gotten slothful in real prayer. It's a 
lesson for us, and perhaps God needed to teach them a lesson. Perhaps when James got caught, the believers thought, oh well, he's an apostle with apostolic gifts like miracles and healings and lots of other supernatural powers. They can't do anything to him. They can only kill us regular Christians. Nothing is mentioned in the text or anywhere else in Scripture about the believers mounting an all-night prayer vigil on behalf of James. And I think it was probably much to their shock that Herod Agrippa actually killed him, chopped off his head, just like Herod Antipas had done to John the Baptist. See, John did no miracles. That's mentioned in the text. But here's James. Why, John was a forerunner. He's Old Testament. But James, brother of John, one of the three big ones, Peter, James, and John. Hey, certainly nothing can happen to him. And when he's caught, they probably thought, they shrugged and went back to work and said, well, it's okay. We know he'll get out. And the news comes. Herod has just cut off his head. Do you think that might have sent a shockwave through the church? I think it probably did. And I think that's why we see the reaction that we see here in these verses we're looking at tonight. What was happening? Clearly the supernatural wall of protection that seemed to let the apostles lead charmed lives was breaking down. And for a reason. You remember, Acts is a transitional book. We're moving from the old order and into a new order. We see new groups being brought in and we've seen that up to this point. The apostles were necessary for the bringing in of all the new groups into the body of Christ. But dear people, we cannot expect God to always do the same kinds of things that he's done in the past. His character does not change, but he uses many different methods to accomplish his purposes. Some people are led to Christ, for example, under the preaching of the word of God in a church. Some are led to Christ through the preaching of the word of God in an open-air campaign. Some are led to Christ by a co-worker who shares the scripture with them. Some are led to Christ by reading the Word of God on their own. Some are led to Christ by reading a tract or hearing a radio broadcast or hearing a television broadcast. Now there's something central to all of that and it's the Word of God. But the method that God uses to get the Word to those people was different in each different case. Now we find God in this transitional period making it clear that even the apostles are subject to death. And if the church wants the apostles to live so that they might continue to benefit from the ministry of the apostles, the church also has to be involved. Now Peter, the chief apostle here in Jerusalem, is suddenly being captured too. He's been caught as well. The church is being shocked into reality. Now Herod knew the Jewish customs. In fact, that's the reason that they're mentioned here in the text. It's to draw our attention to the fact, not merely giving us a time marker as to where this is happening in the book of Acts, but it is to give us an understanding of why the things happen that happen. He knew the Jewish customs. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is mentioned here in the text. You know that God ordained certain feasts in the Old Testament. There were seven divinely ordained feasts of God, and the Jews added an eighth feast to that, the Feast of Hanukkah, the Feast of Lights, because of the rededication of the temple and the miracle of the lamps. 
and the compounding of the oil and how they were able to compound the oil necessary to relight the lamps in the temple after it was defiled by Antiochus Epiphanes who sacrificed a sow on the altar at Jerusalem. And so we have the Feast of Lights, the Feast of Dedication, it's called in the book of John, the Feast of Hanukkah, which we call it today. But there are seven biblical feasts and two of them are mentioned here in the text. The Feast of Unleavened Bread was always followed by the Feast of Passover. It's translated Easter in the text, text it's Pesach, that's Passover. Perhaps Herod thought that he was going to make a name for himself by doing it at that season. Think about this for a moment. Because Jesus was killed at the Passover. And now he's got the chief disciple. He's got Peter. Oh, wouldn't that be fun to kill the chief disciple at the same season of the year and make those Jews truly grateful to him for nipping that new bud, that new religion in the bud. People, nothing happens by accident in the plan of God. Peter could have been caught at a different time of year, but he wasn't. God could have seen to it that Peter was caught after this. But God was going to foil the plans of Satan. You see, God had designed Passover for a very specific sacrifice, for a very specific fulfillment. For a very specific purpose that related to the Messiah. It didn't relate to Peter. God had a plan whereby the memory of Passover would not be tied back to Peter, as Rome has tried to do, tying St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome back to Peter with the relics of Peter. Other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So God was going to show the Jews something. He was going to show the disciples something. He was going to show Herod something. And he was going to show a hapless group of 16 men, four quaternions of soldiers, something. He was going to make a point at a very specific period of the year about redemption. That's why Peter is rescued at this time, because the sacrifice has already been made. Because redemption has already been provided. Because the one who provides redemption is not, as in Mormon theology, being redeemed by your own blood for your sins and having to be murdered in certain cases to make that happen. But redemption has occurred because of one sacrifice for sin forever. That is our Lord Jesus Christ. So here are the lessons. The church, Peter, Herod, the soldiers, and by the way, a quaternion of soldiers, that's a rather tough group of men. These were men who always went into battle together, four of them, and they were assigned to a small spot of ground to hold it, and they would stand back to back, so it made a square. And they would have their shields on one arm, which defended not only themselves, but the guy next to them. And then, no matter which direction the enemy came from, they would be able to cut the enemy down. Very, very hard to break into that tightly knit group of four soldiers. And Herod was not going to take any chances. He had four quaternions of soldiers there. Sixteen men to guard one guy in a prison cell. I think Herod had probably heard about some of the miracles that Peter had done, that John had done, that others among the apostles had done. And he thought to himself, I'm going to try to make sure as well as I can that this guy does not get out. What futility. Very much like sealing the stone over the door of the tomb of the Lord Jesus. When God wants to open a door, no man can shut it. And when God wants to shut a door, no man can open it. And Jesus says so in the book of Revelation. 
Here we find an illustration of that. Herod wanted to shut a door. God said, I want to open it. Who do you think won that contest? Dear people, have you ever faced what looks like a solid wall in front of you in your life? Have you ever come up to what looks like a dead end and there is no door and there is no window? You've heard the old saying, but it's not really what should be taught. Well, if there is not a door, then go through the window. No. If God wants you to go forward, He opens a door so wide that you could drive a tank through it. God is the one who opens doors. God, as Noah learned, and as the people of the world that perish learned, God is the one who closes doors. The door in scripture is a very important image. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. You only have to enter once to become one of his sheep. And then you go in and out to pasture. The door. There was a prison door. It was closed. Not only were there soldiers on the outside of that door, there were soldiers on the inside of that door because it tells us that they were chained to Peter. If he wiggled, they would be awake with their swords. A humanly impossible situation. But God delights in the impossible next time you face something that you think is impossible, remember Peter in prison. God is not obligated to deliver you. He let James be killed. Often we think, oh poor James, because he got killed and Peter, why he got to live. <laughs> Wrong perspective actually, from the divine point of view. How wonderful for James he not only met the martyr's death and received the martyr's crown, but he got to be instantly with Jesus. He didn't have to live here any longer. God was the one who appointed the day of his death. And he was ready. You know, God has appointed the day of your death. Yes, it is fixed. In the eternal plan of God, there is a point at which you will step into glory if you're a believer, or if you're not, that you will step into hell. You can't lengthen your days, you can't shorten your days. The only thing you can do is use your days for Christ. Maximize your opportunities. Maximize your potential. Build into the moments of your life things that count forever. Use the resources that God has given you to build something besides a fat estate. The doors. The man. The timing of life. The timing of death. It's interesting, Peter wasn't worried. He was asleep. Peter had been in prison before. In fact, several times we know of in the book of Acts, and perhaps he'd been in prison more than that. You see, this was nothing new to him. It was, yeah, I've been here before. Maybe he'd even been in that same cell. We don't know. But here, the church is learning a lesson. No prayer, apparently, for James, certainly not mentioned in the text. But now, James is dead. They're no longer the twelve apostles. They're only eleven. Peter has been taken. They must pray. Have you ever been forced to pray? Where you've come up against such a crisis situation that you had to drop everything else because it was so intensely important. There have been a few times in my life 
of that has happened. Where I had to cancel everything. Where I had to go to prayer. Where I couldn't stay asleep at night. Where I had to get up and pray. I knew I had to. I knew it was a crisis. I knew without prayer that I was having some very, very serious difficulties if God didn't answer. Have you been there? When it came, what did you do? Did you fret? Did you worry? Did you act frustrated? Did you get mad at God and yell at Him? Did you get mad at somebody else and yell at them? You faced the crisis. Did you know that no crisis comes into your life unless God puts it there? Here's a crisis in the life of Peter. He's relaxed. He can sleep. But it's a crisis in the life of the church. Peter doesn't mind going to heaven. Peter has learned what it means to walk by faith and obey the Lord and go where he wants him to go and do what he wants him to do. He learned that lesson in Acts chapter 10. We're two chapters later now. What does it take for God to teach us that lesson where we must pray where we must pray not only individually where we must pray corporately you see that's the crisis for the church here their chief pastor has suddenly been jerked into prison now what are they going to do years ago as you know Dr. Ian Paisley was thrown into prison for three months in Ireland, and Dr. McIntyre came from this church and preached at Martyrs Memorial Presbyterian Church in Belfast, Ireland, while Dr. Paisley was in prison for open-air evangelization. And he wouldn't stop it. And I recently received an email from him in which he was delighted to say, you know, those open-air meetings are still going on today. There was prayer offered for him continuously while he was in prison. Because he was in prison for the proclamation of the gospel of Christ. Here the church is learning a lesson and they sprang into action immediately with unceasing prayer. Notice something else. It's the entire church. It's the whole church. And you know, it wasn't just the women. The men were at prayer meeting too. The men were busy praying. The men weren't waiting for somebody else to pray. You know, we find there is a great deal of exhortation in Scripture concerning prayer. There's so much we won't be able to cover it all even if we did a whole series on this, but I'm not going to do a series on prayer at this point. But I want to draw our attention to a few verses that certainly apply to us, and which I think may have perhaps been in the mind of the Apostle Paul when he was thinking about the situation with Peter there in Jerusalem. Because he exhorts other churches to do what the church at Jerusalem did. How about 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17? You know this verse. It's only three words long. But it tells us something about the type of prayer life God expects of His children. Three words. Pray without ceasing. Now, how much prayer is that? Is that the five-minute ditty that you say right before you go to bed? Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul will take, it take five minutes. It may even take 30 seconds. Pray without ceasing? How is that possible? Folks, every command that is given in the Bible is impossible in the flesh. You can't find any command in the New Testament, especially... Because those are commands that relate to us. You cannot find any command in the New Testament that you can accomplish in the flesh. You can't. Because the flesh is weak. The flesh profits nothing. Not a little bit. The flesh profits nothing. 
pray without ceasing. The only way you can pray that way is when you are walking in the Spirit. The only way you can pray that way is when you are walking by faith. The only way you can pray that way is when you are living by faith. Because every moment of every day will be an incessant, continual communication with your Heavenly Father who will be directing you by His Spirit to the next activity, the next thing to say, the next thought to come across your mind. It will be a continual, life-giving pipe that is flowing between you and the Heavenly Father. It is a lifestyle. Pray without ceasing. What was the church doing? They were having an all-night prayer meeting. They were praying without ceasing. They were beating on the doors of heaven. They were crying out for God's mercy. I think not only for Peter, but for themselves. They suddenly began to realize how important he was to the church. And what a blow it would be to the testimony of Christ if Peter were allowed to be killed. You pray for church leaders across this land and around the globe. Those who are missionaries, who in different time zones are facing crisis situations that you may not know about for a month until the next praise and prayer letter comes out. Do you pray for them continuously? When they come to mind, do you think, oh yeah, I thought about so and so. When God brings them to your mind, do you pray for them? You don't know what's happening at that very moment on the far side of the globe. But God does. And God hears the prayers of His people and God answers the prayers of His people. And that's what God is teaching us here. No prayer is mentioned about James and James is killed. Prayer is mentioned about Peter, and as we'll see next week, the Lord willing, what an incredible deliverance God gives to him. Because there are many complex things that are interacting here. This is Passover. This is not Peter's time. That was Jesus' time. But also God is teaching the church, you need to learn to pray. We find the Apostle Paul in... First chapter, First Thessalonians chapter five, verse twenty-five. Just a few verses after, pray without ceasing. We read these words, four words in that verse. Brethren, pray for us. Paul was an apostle, just like Peter. There was incessant prayer made for Peter by the church, and God delivered Peter. And Paul had a zeal and a desire to give a testimony for Christ. He knew that to depart and be with Christ was far better. Nevertheless, he said, for your sakes, it's necessary that I stay around for a while. But Paul says, brethren, pray for us. He understood the power of undergirding prayer. Is that the way you pray for this church? Is that the way you pray for me? Is that the way you pray for your elders? Perhaps part of the weakness we see is that there is not cover laid down for those who are at the front of the battle. There's been no bombardment by the prayer aircraft to soften up the enemy front. And the troops on the other side are holding the ground well and grinning about it. Because there's been no cover fire. As the ground shock troops crawl through the mud, there's been no machine gun fire over their heads into the enemy line of fortifications. You see, the Christian life is portrayed as warfare. When the religious persecution stopped, government persecution 
picked up where it left off. And it got worse, and it was compounded by the fact that there was a famine going on at the same time. Don't wait until it gets too bad before you start your prayer life. A real prayer life. A prayer life like we see here. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. It's men. That's the male word here, translated men, not the generic term for human beings, but the word for males. This is what men are supposed to be doing because men are supposed to lead in this area. then when we pray the way God wants us to, the Holy Spirit picks up where we fail. Romans 8.26 Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. There are some things that you and I simply cannot vocalize. There are some situations that are so complex we can't frame it properly so that it will come before the presence of God in a, an intelligent way. But God knows the problem. And as we pour out our hearts, even though it seems like disorganized chaos to us, the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings, with a deep sigh. Because he cares with groanings which cannot be uttered. This is not tongues in that verse. Tongues can be uttered. This is groanings which cannot be uttered. And that's why the Holy Spirit must pick it up where we can go no further. Oh, there is so much here. So many other verses that we've looked at, but I think that gives us the picture. As we look here at Acts chapter 12. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James the brother of John with the sword, and because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened holidays got broken into. How often we dislike it, how intensely we dislike it, if somebody interrupts our holidays. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison. But prayer was made without ceasing. First Thessalonians 5.17 Pray without ceasing. You know, years ago, the Moravians, founded by Count Nicholas von Zinzendorf, the one whose hymn I mentioned this morning, Jesus, Thy Blood and Righteousness, that magnificent hymn, this count founded a place called Herrenhut, the house of the Lord. And there the Moravians fled and joined together. From there they sent missionaries to all over the world. You perhaps remember a few years ago we showed the film First Fruits about the Moravian missionaries who came to the West Indies to work among the slaves and to lead them to Christ and the things that they suffered. Moravians today have gone liberal. They still have magnificent choirs. They have some gigantic churches. They have places here in the United States that people go to every year for various festivals. What made the difference back then and now? The Moravians had a 24-hour prayer chain that went on for over 100 years. 
where people would come to their chapel 24 hours a day and there was always someone there who was praying by name for their leaders, who was praying by name for each of their missionaries, who was praying by name for those in positions of authority over them. Dear people, this church has only been around for 75 years. They kept that prayer chain going for over 100 years. began to dissipate and things began to crumble and they are what they are today still gorgeous music oh some of the Moravian music is incredible it brings tears to your eyes because it was written back when that prayer chain was going on and when they had a fervent zeal for the gospel of Christ powerful music beautiful music not like the punk rock stuff that goes for Christian music today I think one of the keys was the prayer of the church prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him it wasn't generalized prayer it was not dear God bless all the missionaries it was specific directed prayer for a specific directed person with a specific directed need. Prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for Him. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank You once again for Your Word and for its power. Cause it to penetrate deep into our hearts. Let us not ignore it. Let us not assume that it's for someone else. Help us to understand that it is for us if we would see the victories and the growth that we see in the book of Acts. If we would see the supernatural provision not only for the financial needs and for the food needs and for other believers to give so that we would not have to suffer. Father, so that Christ would be glorified and magnified, so that he would be exalted, so that the world might know that there is a living God in heaven who hears the prayers of his saints. Father, we pray that you'll take your word and use it in our hearts. We pray these things in Jesus' name. closing hymn for tonight.